Hello and good morning. Uh, myself is Sriram. Uh, I'm a senior architect at CalSoft. Uh, I have Swapnil, who is my co-presenter. He's an active contributor into OpenStack. Uh, before we jump into the details, uh, the nitty gritties, maybe I should speak about Bipin and Kashish. They are uh, two dynamic young, young folks who have uh, helped me with each and every uh, re-edits, maybe uh, 10 to 20 times that we had to do before we got this. OK. Uh, so we can quickly go through the agenda here. The agenda is plain and simple. The problem statement, essentially, what is that we are trying to address? Secondly, uh, followed by proposed solution. This is an overview uh, of what we are trying to propose, how it is going to make the changes. Uh, then solution prerequisites. Uh, so solutions pre prerequisites are something like these are uh, some uh, set of changes that are kind of required whether we choose any of the approaches uh, following which are being discussed. Um, approach one is about uh, client unaware striping. So essentially you can say that uh, the existing clients would be able to work as it is uh, without any changes. Uh, but it would possibly have some kind of limitations, though. Approach two is a client-aware striping, where even the client contributes into this effort. And this can make uh, a much bigger uh, impact. Uh, this is followed by possibly set of use cases. We have kind of five use cases which we have tried to put here from the real world, uh, which are like we want to exp uh, how to export object store as a volume. Um, second would be like, uh, can we implement something like a redirect on write uh, base snapshots, a uh, row snapshot kind of thing. Um, third is like a CDP solution. Can it be built on this object store, which is having striping support? Fourth is a bit different thing, uh, something like trim or unmap. Uh, in a typical storage world, especially this is used with uh, a SAN environment or even with uh, latest SSDs that you, you have the trim or unmap support. So uh, how can that be brought into uh, with striping, actually? And finally, uh, can we build an object-based file system? So these are the f five use cases that we are trying to think about. Uh, so you can possibly start relating it when we are discussing the approaches, actually. Uh, following this, there are some announcements and future scope. Uh, so one of them, which I can quickly mention, is about like we are also trying to think, can something like erasure coding be used instead of the current multi-copy mirroring that is happening in Swift? Uh, and there are, uh, there are some more uh, future, future scope things. Appendix is typically having something like the JSON headers, uh, which uh, for the HTTP request that would be modified in case of in in, in this implementation. Uh, so it is more for the developers who would believe in this idea and would want to implement it. So it's it's just some kind of a guideline. Uh, apart from that, there are C also. Uh, so C also has something kind of. Uh, the rest of the papers which we are trying to work, uh, which possibly didn't get selected, but would certainly be put on our website. So there are five more papers that we are trying to work on, actually, which should be available on CalSoft's website soon. Mm. Moving on, yeah. So the problem statement. So traditionally, uh, an object <coughs> store has been viewed as a store for small, uh, smaller size objects. Uh, say, having said that, Swift does support large objects. Yeah, it, it does so. And it's for dynamic, and in the form of a dynamic object, large object, or a uh, static large object. And the means of doing it is like it does it by segmentation and uh, via a manifest file. Uh, typically, you must be aware of this, like manifest file is, you can say it is the root file to this large object, which is storing all the segment-related information. Uh, so essentially, you hit into the manifest file, get all the segments-related information, where are they lying, and then it's spoke to those particular segments. And that's how the 
get and put request would be executed. Uh, limitations obviously for large objects are today like uh, it's still uh, costly in terms of time, in the network bandwidth usage or even the storage utilization I'll say. Um, manifest file is limited by number of segments. Uh, as the number of segments starts growing, it becomes really difficult to manage large objects and stuff. Uh, well, I've been discussing a, a lot about large objects, but more important fact that we are trying to uh, cover is varying size objects, be it a regular, small, medium object, as, or be it large objects. They are being treated separately or differently in Swift today. And that is what uh, we would like to go away from, actually. Uh, well, uh, if, if there are any questions in between, please feel to raise your hand and ask. That should be OK. I, I would prefer to have an interactive session. Uh, 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 so proposed solution. So what is the proposed solution? So object striping is a technology. It's not a solution by itself, actually. So when it is blended with uh, the sparse object or parallel reads and writes to multiple object servers and vectored IO at the object server end, uh, then this equation actually builds up a solution which we are trying to look out for. So it's, it's, it can be treated as an equation actually. So delving into uh, the details, like object striping is not much different than the today's segmentation or chunking. Uh, but the most important thing is it is not confined to only large objects. So essentially like uh, as the object size increases, you'll see more and more stripes. So it, uh, you treat all the objects similarly. Uh, well, uh, this also helps in like, uh, what to say, um, uh, in, in uh, storing this object, yeah. comparison to erasure encoding. As you're working through this, can you make trying to do this really to a way and how the different vendors are working at it or address it in a different way by just updating the segmentation process? Uh, or, or implementing an erasure encoding? So uh, erasure coding, uh, certainly we haven't thought in this process, but uh, when, when we were uh, went in quite a details about this, we realize that erasure coding is something that can be certainly added. But that, in case, it would be more of a problem uh, we are trying to solve at a larger scale. Essentially, the replication part of whatever uh, proxy tries to do, uh, like whatever our replica number is stuff. So those all stuff would be totally removed, the multi-copy mirroring. But that is not exactly what we are trying to solve here, uh, at least in, in, this, in this paper as such. Uh, here we are trying to solve m maybe a better way of segmentation, better handling of objects, and uh, based on that, what all can be achieved actually. Does that answer? Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, going ahead, like, uh, yeah. So I was trying to say that object striping actually uh, will also enable uh, the object to be uh, spanned across multiple object servers. So uh, we'll see how exactly in just a uh, couple of minutes. Uh, sp sparse objects. Now sparse object is something like uh, essentially uh, not all the stripes need to be consumed. When I say that uh, it's a sparse object, uh, you just say that it's an one GB object, but possibly you have just stored a single stripe in it at an offset of maybe one GB. So essentially, uh, the disk space com consumption, if you're considering, it's just one MB. But object size, it's possibly one GB. So virtually, you can say that uh, we are also getting away with the limitation of uh, the size, object size, essentially. So you can write to any offset of an object, and uh, it should be done, kind of things. Mm -hmm. Following this. Uh, parallel reads and writes. Uh, so essentially here, what we're trying to do is, since the stripes are going to be uh, pushed into multiple partitions, and so essentially into multiple object servers, 
the read and write operations are going to involve multiple objects, uh, object servers. So, in in literal sense, we can get parallelism because object servers are completely different entities to which you can send the request. You read all the stripes in parallel from all the object servers that are involved. Uh, but here also, we have to be really optimal. We can't just say that we'll try to assume, um, use maximum number of them, but it should still be an optimal maximum number. It can't be too huge. Uh, so that is what uh, we're trying to put here. Following this like vector IO. Uh, so here, uh, the way to look at uh, this complete uh, object or uh, its, its uh, life cycle or what to say, um, it's, it's topology, you can say. So a single object, you can say that it is divided into set of sub-objects. These sub-objects sub go into maybe unique partitions. And so, so, so the term sub-object has been introduced already. So it, it, is, it is nothing but an object or a, a smaller uh, size object which is holding one or more number of stripes, but not certainly all the, all the stripes. Uh, so here, uh, essentially, what we are trying to do is the sub-object itself will be something like a sparse file or, or a sparse object by itself. So suppose that there are just two stripes to be written to a particular sub-object, then they would be written to that particular offset. This doesn't, uh, so being a sparse file kind of an implementation, it is not going to consume any extra space uh, for the holes that are going to be created. Actually. Uh, it is just going to write to those particular offsets and that is the maximum space that is going to be uh, consumed. So considering this, uh, vector IO is something that really makes sense because we might want to write or read multiple uh, stripes from a single sub-object on every uh, partition or every object server. So vector IO is something that we are trying to propose which should be uh, used to do uh, the, the required I.O. actually at the object server end. So essentially, uh, uh, looking at the advantages that can be gained, it's like the optimal party, uh, maximum number of uh, object servers being involved in read and writes, increase in Swift's throughput, uh, then load sharing across multiple object servers, uh, because uh, when we were trying to do a bit of experimentation with this, uh, we, uh, we found that, uh, that with the, even with the existing hashing functionality, uh, the stripes were getting very much evenly distributed across partitions and hence across the object servers. So uh, being an even distribution or at least moving towards even distribution of stripes, uh, the storage consumption on every uh, partition and hence object server is evenly done. This not only helps with the uh, parallel reads and writes, but possibly can help us with uh, rebalancing also. When a new object server node is being added or removed, <coughs> we, we move the partitions. And now most of the partitions being consumed evenly, it would really make sense and the rebalancing effort uh, would be helped a lot. Uh, next advantage could be like uh, the object size has no limitation now. Uh, you can go to whatever size, be it 10 GB, 100 GB, whatever size you want. It's just the offset that at, at which the stripe is going to be written. And, uh, and most importantly, uh, not uh, all the objects, be it a small object, be it a large object, is going to be treated uh, in a similar way or a fashion. Uh, any questions about this? Okay. So this is a quick glossary. Uh, we already introduced uh, the sub-object term, but here it is uh, mentioned. Portion of an object consisting of one or more stripes stored sparsely in a partition, uh, or a partition file, I'll say. Uh, there are other terms. Uh, we have added a term of Stripe ID, a unique identifier from Stripe within an object. Uh, stripe size is something that is uh, just to be defined and stored in the objects uh, or the container database, more for uh, as, as the striping information. Okay. Uh, 
container db uh, so this is a change in the database schema that we are trying to propose object id does <coughs> exist stripe size is something that we want to add to it object size uh, is what we would like to add object on disk size so on disk size would be more for like what is the actual consumption of the storage is what can be very well known object version delta size so this will uh, this term will be uh, very much used when we discuss about uh, the use case about snapshotting uh, over object servers or object stores and uh, also a cdp kind of solution a continuous data protection solution uh, so essentially uh, there are some uh, thumb rules that we would like to follow like different objects may have different ob uh, stripe sizes but uh, but for a given object the stripe size remains same so it is once it is decided then it becomes immutable so i mean these are thought uh, in a way that uh, we don't want to make drastic changes in swift uh, because then uh, adopting to it would be really difficult so we are trying to put certain set of limitations in our approach also uh, so here are some uh, formulas actually uh, so what is a stripe id a stripe id can be simply uh, said to be the numbering uh, but we have tried to define it more as a function a function of stripe offset stripe size object path and partition now possibly uh, stripe size and offset is very much understood by everyone the reason we are trying to add this optional parameters of object path and partition size is if you want to implement a, a better function uh, by which uh, you can even distribute these types you can make better decisions based on the object path and the partition size also um, similarly uh, there is a uh, another function which is stripe offset which can be uh, calculated from stripe id stripe size object path and partition size so the relationship between these two functions is like they are inverse to each other kind of so if you have stripe id uh, you will be able to find the stripe offset if you have stripe offset you will be able to find the stripe id and that's how these function need to be uh, defined mm. so, so uh, one one more thing like uh, yeah um, so essentially the stripe id is never um, what to say stored as such there's no database entry that you have seen here that we have tried to put so it is always it is something that can be always calculated by any of the entities actually uh, so role of this um, stripe id hash so object id uh, we know about what it is uh, stripe id hash is nothing but this will be a new url that we'll try to form and its hash would be something as stripe id hash so we are appending uh, a stripe id to it so so the salient points here can be like today object id was uh, is being used to determining the partition it won't be anymore uh, stripe id hash would instead be used actually uh, to decide the partitions and par so essentially partition is now a set of stripe id hashes and not um, what to say uh, of the object ids actually uh, the advantages possibly we have discussed this even distribution optimal uh, multiple object servers uh, participation and ring rebalancing uh, the extended attributes essentially today they look in this fashion we are saying that uh, from object based uh, extended attributes move to the stripe based uh, extended attributes so uh, there is a stripe id that is being added and possibly the rest of the things pretty much same, uh, remain same but they are with respect to a stripe id essentially uh, you'll have multiple set of uh, extended attributes uh, because uh, a single sub object could hold multiple uh, stripes um, well so this is a basic uh, change in the http request that we are trying to propose here so this is with res respect to a communication between uh, a put request from the proxy to the object server so this is a new header that we want to really add which holds uh, the object id stripe id stripe size http request offset so this is actually the data of the stripes that are coming in and uh, which are need, uh, needed to be sent to an object server and uh, those 
so all the fields determined to uh, uh, enable the object server to get the required information, be it type content length, object size, and stuff like that. So here you we can note actually that there are multiple objects to which a single HTTP request is being sent. So this we'll see how it how it uh, makes sense in the approaches uh, when we discuss them. Mm, the response would be something as follows, like from the object server, for every stripe that has been written, it sends back a uh, status saying that was it a new write, was it an update, was it a, a trimmed value. A trimmed here means we are deallocating the stripe. So here you can see the stripes, uh, stripe delta size that is being discussed out. So essentially, uh, whenever there is a new write, there is a change in the size. So that has been mentioned out here. When it is an, just an update of an existing stripe, then possibly there is no change in the disk space that is being utilized, so it's zero. And trimmed is like you're actually removing the stripe. So essentially, when this response is received by the proxy again, it can just simply add all these values and determine what is the actual object uh, on this size change actually. And just collect all the HTTP requests coming from uh, all the object servers involved for a particular object and it should be able to just add all those and update the container database with the respective on the size actually. So, uh, and similarly stripe max offset is something that can be used to determine the, uh, <coughs> the object size actually. So, these, these functions have been defined out in, in a simple form actually. It's a max of so and so things actually. Moving to the get request, uh, pretty much similar lines you can see. Uh, you uh, The request sends the stripe size, stripe content length, whatever is the ID and the object offsets. Uh, on the uh, object server side, uh, based on the stripe ID, it identifies the offset and uh, gets the uh, stripes, builds this HTTP request and sends it all together. So here also we can see that uh, a collated request of multiple objects or and stripes is sent to a single object server. So it's it's like we're trying to piggyback uh, multiple uh, stripe read requests uh, in a single HTTP request. Moving ahead, there are some miscellaneous changes. Uh, so uh, fingerprinting uh, would be used at the stripe level. Essentially, it is for like. In, in, in a case where the same stripe has been sent over with no changes, object server just calculates the fingerprint for that particular stripe, compare it with the fingerprint that is stored in the extended attributes. If it is the same possible, it doesn't need to do any I and just uh, say a success. With regards to replicator, auditor, and updater, uh, here they will have to now work based on uh, stripes, not on objects. So uh, essentially, whenever an uh, auditor has to check the fingerprints from the hash table, it will go to uh, check the stripes ha fingerprint rather than an object's fingerprint. Uh, so uh, essentially, they mm -hmm. have to work at a granularity of a stripe and rather uh, not at a object. So yes, we are coming to approach one. So there are. Uh, these two approaches. One is a client unaware striping and the other one would be client aware striping. So client unaware striping, if you have to see here, is uh, uh, the proxy is actually going to be involved in striping the objects and uh, collating even the request. So this is totally going to be transparent to the client. Uh, the client just sends as, as today the objects it gets typed on the proxy and then it's uh, sent or collated and then sent to uh, the destined object servers. Uh, the proxy is the one who is essentially going to uh, calculate the stripe ID hash and determine the partitions and hence the object server. Collation, so here what we are trying to do is like just to optimize things, uh, not only uh, request um, for a single object are sent to the object servers, but uh, the requests which are coming from maybe multiple objects, uh, multiple clients for multiple objects, uh, the stripes from each of this object which are destined for 
the same object server, they are collated into a uh, single HTTP request and then sent down to the object server. Uh, so essentially that has to have some collation criteria and we have uh, defined the simplest way. It could be either timeout based or it could be size based. A, tip, a typical SLA, uh, there's nothing different. Uh, so in, in this ap approach, yeah, approach one, the stripe size um, is going to be the same actually uh, for all the objects. Uh, the reason being like typically uh, how does, uh, how, how to determine the stripe size? The stripe size is typically would be a function of something like what is your network bandwidth that is available? Uh, and maybe other processing powers and other stuff. But here, since uh, the striping happens at the proxy and is just sent down to the object server, so you're still in your private network. And you know exactly what is the network bandwidth and possibly it is going to be same across. So there's no point in having different stripe sizes for different objects uh, because it's not going, it's just going to complicate the things. So here, uh, all the objects would be striped at the same size. This is for approach one though. Uh, so typically, uh, how would the put operation uh, work? The request comes as a, as a complete object to the proxy. Uh, the proxy stripes it. Uh, proxy decides the partition based on the stripe ID and the calculation mm -hmm. that it is going to do. It even collates uh, requests from multiple clients for multiple object server, uh, objects. HTTP request for, uh, so it's it's already, uh, it's sent in parallel to all the object servers. Uh, these uh, these sub-objects essentially are written by the object servers using vector IO and a response is sent back. So uh, we are just trying to put all the rings, the Swift proxy and the clients and you can see the stripes of various different objects. So S1 is a stripe of first object, S2 is a, of fourth and kind of things. Uh, moving ahead, uh, so this is how uh, a typical HTTP request would look uh, with regards to uh, the proxy being, uh, uh, the, the, the request coming from proxy to the object server and a response coming from the object server back to the proxy. So it's, it's a typical scenario where we are trying to put uh, like uh, client one is trying to write object one and, uh, and client two is writing object two. So how they get collated and how they are sent down to single object server uh, and how the response comes back actually. Uh, so similarly, on similar lines it's for uh, the get request. Uh, so here mul uh, multiple requests coming from uh, various clients are uh, again converted into stripes, forwarded to the object servers. Uh, when the response comes back from the object servers using vector IO read, it will just collate all those things and send it back to the client. Uh, in this process also, uh, uh, well, uh, that's for approach two. Okay, so, uh, so essentially here the overhead is kind of assembling the object again and then sending it back to the Clients actually. Yeah. Uh, so this is just explaining the scenario with regards to the objects actually, the HTTP request, how they are going to look, uh, look, and how it is going to be formed. So what are the pros, pros and cons, or any other miscellaneous changes? The, the pros are like. Uh, modifications are confined to the Swift server. The client is not involved at all. Uh, this is an increase in effectiveness of vectored I.O. Uh, at the object server as proxy collates the request from multiple uh, clients actually. Since it's trying to collate all the requests coming from uh, various clients and sending it down to the object server, it just uh, is good for vectored I.O. actually. So the performance can be much better. Well, the cons, uh, possibly even today it applies, proxy can be a bottleneck out here in this approach. Uh, collation of stripes of objects from multiple clients leads to synchronization issues. The, the collation criteria that we have tried to mention, uh, which is SLA based, time, time out based or uh, size based, 
that is certainly going to have an uh, impact on synchronization, actually. Well, miscellaneous changes. Uh, so essentially, the changes are uh, in the Swift container server, um, proxy, and object server. And uh, typically, like replication auditor and updater have to work at uh, Stripe level. So, moving on to approach two. Uh, so here, uh, what we are trying to suggest is like, uh, if the client can be really involved in the striping effort, then there is a much more benefit actually. So striping or not really striping as such, but Swift client when being used by the applications above it, uh, if, if uh, they send down the request for may maybe just taking the use case of uh, building a volume over an object server. Uh, or an object uh, a store. So essentially, consider like a couple of objects or few few number of objects, large objects, co are collated to form a volume at the client mm -hmm. side. And in that case, an IOs are happening on a on a particular volume by any application at a random offset. So based on that, actually, if that request is directly sent down to the Swift client, it would be able to determine that okay. <coughs> So it is at so and so offset. So it is possibly I can say is, is part of a particular stripe. So I just need to send that particular stripe as a put request uh, to the object server, and uh, that should be it. So essentially, uh, what we are trying to say is the Swift client is now capable of taking uh, the request at a stripe level from the applications which are using the Swift client. Uh, and, and passing it on over. And similarly, this can apply for the read operations at the uh, volume which is being uh, built over it. Uh, in this, what we are suggesting is also like, we can piggyback the information of the, uh, of the striping uh, in, these get in, uh, in the get request. Put obviously will have it, but get also will try to piggyback. Uh, the only, uh, the thing that we are trying to consider is like, if there are any updates on the object uh, which are not known to the particular Swift client, it can get notified via the get response itself. Well, uh, there is some amount of metadata cache uh, the client will have to store, which would be something similar to what we discussed with the container DB changes. Uh, Stripe ID being a function now can also be calculated by the Swift client. Well. Uh, stripe size of an object. Now here, uh, the stripe size can be determined during the very first put of an object. And so it, it can be a, a function of the network bandwidth and other, other stuff uh, based on whatever client sees. So here it is like, uh, now we are trying to have an optimization starting from the client end to proxy and from proxy to the object server. So everything, uh, the, the network bandwidth is being used very optimally across end-to-end, -end actually. Uh, so here, the client can determine based on its own network bandwidth that, OK, now I want just maybe a half, half MB of a stripe size, because that's, that, that's what would suit me better. In other cases, uh, it could be 1 MB. So it depends on the client and its own parameters that what it is, the stripe size uh, would suit itself. So, uh, so it's an optimization uh, which the client itself can do. Uh, I mean, this is going to complicate the Swift, uh, not really the Swift client, but the applications that are trying to use the Swift client. But uh, but uh, it's it's at a, what to say, uh, it's at at, a, at the optimization that you're going to gain out of it. Uh, so uh, the put request. So essentially, whenever an application sends a request of that, so and so offset of data or data is being changed in this particular object. The the stripe is built out of it, so it could be like some plus some plus minus amount of data that the Swift client will have to pick and then send start sending it down to uh, or send it to the object server. So here uh, the use cases that we have tried to discuss in that it's very much possible that. Uh, the application itself is trying to do something like an vectored I.O. On, on this volume that is built over the objects. So the Swift client could get uh, multiple uh, read or write requests, essentially, which are uh, get or put requests uh, from Swift's perspective. 
and these all requests can be then collated and sent out to the object uh, to the proxy actually. So essentially it is like striping is happening out here, sending it to the proxy, the requests are then uh, sent down to various uh, object servers and they give back the responses and respective uh, clients are given the required set of stripes. It is not the complete object ever. It is always going to be in terms of stripes now. Uh, well, this is a scenario where Swift clients want to write or modify some stripes of object 1 and object 2. So here the stripe size we have just taken for an illustration of 1024 and uh, so 1KB and 1.5KB. Uh, so Swift client forms a single request and clubs information of modified data <coughs> of stripes in it and sends a write, put a write or a put request actually. So this is the put request that would come from client to the proxy. Proxy based on the stripe ID identifies the object servers uh, as was in even the object, uh, even in the um, approach one uh, and then sends it to the respective objects, uh, object servers. So S2 for object one and S1, S3 of object two reside on the same object. So all these three stripes would be sent to the same object server. Uh, this is how the response would look like, uh, this being a put request of all new writes kind of thing. So the response from object server to proxy is going to be uh, the status as new write, uh, stripe delta size is going to be an addition and when this information is received by a proxy, uh, proxy is going to send back uh, pretty much similarly uh, a response to the client. So here in this second approach. Uh, I, w I would say that proxy is acting more or uh, more or less like a pass through actually. It is not trying to do a, a, a heavy or it is not doing any hef heavy lifting actually. Whatever heavy lifting is being done is mostly at the client end. So essentially the processing and stuff we have pushed it uh, to the clients and we are utilizing more and more resources actually rather than all the load coming to Swift itself, it is the clients also doing some amount of uh, processing actually. Uh, well, on, on similar lines, the get request, uh, the, the what, whatever are the stripes that are requested by the uh, application to the Swift client, those as get request in a collated form are sent to the proxy. They, then proxy actually identifies where uh, these stripes have to be read, read from, essentially the partitions and hence the object servers. Uh, gets all or fetches all all of them from the object servers, collates it together and rather here another benefit is like the proxy is not going to assemble all these types. So whatever order it receives from the uh, multiple object servers, it can just uh, club it together and send it back. In earlier approach if we see, we'll, we had to actually assemble the uh, stripes because uh, the clients are not yet aware of striping and stuff. So. The proxy has had to have a complete object, so it has to be assembled together. But here, that's not the case. Even the client is aware of the striping, so you can just send it in whatever order you received it, and client can uh, client is efficient or uh, knowledgeable enough to take the decisions. Uh, so here, uh, this this is just a uh, what to say an illustration of how the HTTP request would uh, look like. Uh, these are special headers, these are not part of the existing HTTP. So these are the headers that we are adding. Mm, well, I think we can skip this. This is the response. So here we can see actually that uh, the piggyback information in the get response actually. So here we are trying to say that the object size has been changed which possibly you were not aware of uh, and you can update your metadata cache at the client end. So it helps in its further uh, striping and other stuff actually. Uh, well, uh, pros of this, like uh, proxy is offloaded from striping and collation task. It's no more its task. It's a task of the clients itself or rather not even the clients because applications that are using Swift client are anyways going to do uh, kind of 
vectored I.O. or uh, multiple offset uh, I.O.s. So essentially, this has been off offloaded in this ap approach. Then we are utilizing more of the client resources than at the uh, Swift server resources. Um, reducing network bandwidth usage from client end to the object end, object server end actually. So, uh, so it's not just limited to the Swift server. So it's, it's much more optimal uh, from network usage. Uh, cons are like proxy still has to assemble all the stripes coming from multiple object servers. Uh, so as, as we know that uh, since the sub objects could reside on multiple objects, the reads are going to be parallelly done. But uh, at least it has to wait till all the reads are done from the object server. Maybe we can think of this as an optimization where uh, it could be sent down whatever uh, uh, stripes have been uh, read can be sent down back to the Swift client and just say that uh, wait for another set of uh, stripes that are coming. We are not yet done kind of thing. So this, this con can still be uh, removed. Well, miscellaneous changes. Uh, actually, we are touching possibly all the components of Swift uh, in, in a limited fashion. A replicator, auditor, and updater have to work on uh, stripe basis and not at the object. So we are, we are kind of done with the two approaches. Uh, we'll move into use cases. If, if there are any questions on the approaches, yeah, sure. So essentially, if you have seen the container database changes, mm -hmm. uh, we have kept it really minimal. There's no striping information that we are storing at all, uh, or, or stripe information, I'd say. We are just storing basic striping information. By striping information and stripe information, how I would like to distinguish is, striping information is the information required to do striping. And stripe information is like every stripes information has been kept out there. So. And that's why it was very important that we had to define uh, Stripe ID as a function and not as a database value. The Stripe ID is not a database value. It is a function. And that, that, that would make a, a big difference. You don't yeah, need to go to the container. The, the, the right, 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 right. Any other questions? Uh, well, uh, we would recommend approach two, uh, but it, it would be something like uh, a, a bigger change. So, so is there any way you could say you could say maybe in both approaches by by allowing allowing the by sending the flag on again a third operation that will tell what the template of the web page is and how to do it? Well, yes, uh, certainly this can be done. This, there's nothing that is going to stop it. Uh, and based on the, maybe we can say that the client, based on the client versions, we can just decide whether proxy has to be involved in the striping or not and well just. That's what I mean is, for example, if you enable something like that in which you have a flag on the ground of a template file, then hmm. you then have the option of the client not available, which means you can ask it to speak in one way and make some callbacks. Right, 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 exactly, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. I'm, I'm just wonder if you modify a single stripe, I mean, stripe number five, let's say, how you deal then with uh, generating ETAC for whole object, if I just want to do a head? So if I understand the question right, you're saying multiple clients are updating? No, no, no. Uh, so I have um, my object, right, and it's built from 10 stripes, okay. let's say, right? And then, as far as I understand, I can modify one of, the, of those stripes. Yes, you can. Right? Yeah. So I'll modify stripe number four. Okay. And then I just want to get a head for the whole object, which contain ETAC, which is basically MD5 sum for the whole object, right? So how are you dealing in that case? Because you need to regenerate ETAC, right? 
if I modify this single stripe? Uh, so uh, uh, we, we are not really storing the fingerprint at an object level. We are saying the fingerprint will be stored only at stripe level. Right, but still, if I just do a list, right. right? If I just doing list, I'm just getting information that my hash is uh, that very specific, right? Right. So if I just do list for the object which con contains all the stripes, it should contain the proper MD5 sum. Otherwise, if I just uh, do a list and then I just get the get get, then my validation of the MD5 sum will be incorrect. Uh, right. So essentially, uh, uh, if, if we are going by approach two, then possibly even the client is not really requiring any object level uh, MD5 sum. Yes, but what about the client which is unaware about the stuff? Right. In, in that case, possibly what we'll have to do is something like an incremental uh, hash function would have to be implemented. Uh, following these are just the use cases. I'll just like uh, take a minute or so. So we can, uh, because now striping and collation is supported, uh, uh, it can be used as a volume uh, or object storage can be used as volume. So that is uh, first use case. Second is like, uh, so uh, we were thinking also like once that is done, possibly we can have it uh, put over a SCSI target. The Swift client is coming to a SCSI target, and that SCSI target is now exposing those volumes as uh, o or over various fabrics like iSCSI, FC, FCOE, anything. So essentially, it can be extended to that level too. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the striping certainly yeah. helps build, uh, or with striping, we can certainly how help how build it. Hmm? How can you deal with the consistency between different object servers uh, for storing objects? Uh, possibly, I'm not getting your question. Yeah, maybe we'll. Uh, so uh, the presentation would be available uh, on, on the URL, uh, possibly which will be published. If there are any questions, you can certainly mail me uh, on my official ID, sriram.pore at uh, calsoftimc.com. Uh, so just the use cases, uh, redirect on write snapshot can be implemented. Uh, more add, continuous data protection can be implemented. Uh, and there is something called as trim or unmap that can be really supported. So this you'll find a relevance with SSDs today. And finally, something like an object-based file system. Uh, so maybe uh, you can read through this presentation. And if you have any questions offline or otherwise over mail, I'll be more than happy to answer them. Thanks.